Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our next webinar in the Club Support Hub webinar series with Football Queensland. I'm Michael Connolly from CPR Group, and it's really good to see so many people here again this evening. It's been three weeks since our last session, and so I'd like to officially welcome everyone from literally all up and down the state. So I can see there are lots of people who've been with us for all of the sessions so far, and we've even got some people from some sneak innerers from some other sports joining us this evening as well. So you're very welcome, and we hope you get a lot out of this evening's session. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging the traditional owners of all of the land where we work, where we walk and where we live, and we recognise their continuing connection to land, to waters and to culture, and of course we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Joining me this evening also is Courtney Fredrickson from CPR Group. Good evening, Courtney. How are you? Good evening, Michael. Very good, thank you. Fantastic. Courtney will be moderating the chat and the questions this evening as well. So you'll see over in the left hand side of the screen there, there's a place where you can start to have a chat. There's a chat box there. There is also a questions area. So if you'd like to ask questions, that you can put them in there. Of course, if you ask a question in the chat, that's perfectly okay. We had a few of those last time, a few people apologizing. So I'm really sorry, I put a question in the chat. That's perfectly fine. But get the conversation going. Say hello to everyone. Introduce yourselves to those uh, the people who are online this evening. And Courtney will keep an eye on that as we go through this evening. If you've got questions, we'll come to those through the session and also towards the end of the evening as well. So feel free to ask any sorts of questions as well. The benefit of turning up to these things live rather than, and of course the recordings will all be made available as they have been for the other sessions as well. But the benefit in coming to these sessions live is that you get to participate in the chat. We will of course hang around for a little while afterwards as usual if there are any questions, but sometimes if they're going to take a little bit longer then we can deliberate on, I'll deliberate on those and come back to them. So you'll see that this is where we are. We're at the midpoint. So this is number three of six sessions that we've already got organised. So this evening is, as Steve and I said last time, it is seriously one of our favourite topics because it's all about money. It's all about making sure that clubs understand that sport is business. Big business. You've only got to have a look at what's going on in Tokyo right now and what's going to be happening here in 11 years' time to know that it is serious. Like internationally, sport is very serious. So the more seriously we can take it at club level, the more we benefit from having a really good approach to financial management and budgeting. So that's what all that's all about what this evening is about. Uh, and then a couple of in three weeks' time, we then follow on staying with the money topic and talking about opportunities for grants as well. So that's a really good session. So if you haven't already registered for that, head to cprgroup.com.au slash fqwebinars2021 and register for that. Then you'll see that the other two sessions are going to be in the off season. So they're in uh, later in the year into October. And they're going to be looking into the future with uh, regards to some infrastructure and also participation as far as football goes. So let's get into it. And I'd like to start this evening by talking very specifically about money. And I want you to go back in time. So I just want you up here to think back, let's just say several years. I want to ask you to think, to admit how old you are even to yourself. But I want you to think that if you could go back in time and if you were to invest just $2.74 every day, that would work out to being $1,000 a year. Now, I'm going to tell you, the, tell you the way that I think about this story. So I've got a daughter who is now 18. Yes, thank you very much. I know I don't look old enough to have a daughter who is 18. Yes, you're all very kind. And I think back and I think if I could go back in time and put $1,000 a year and just, you know, forego a cup of coffee each day to be able to do that, if I invested that $2.74 at simply at the All Ordinaries Accumulation Index by that time, by her first birthday, it would have been worth $1,055.63. Boring. And that's why we stop. Typically, we think, well, I've put $1,000 in, I've done $2.74 every day, and it's worked out to be only $55.63 more. So we stop, and we don't keep going. But it's not about trying to time the market. It's about how long you can stay in there. So by her fifth birthday... I would have invested five grand, but it would be now worth six and a half. By her 10th birthday, more than $17,000. And on her 16th birthday, when she was saving up to buy a car, it would have been worth just under $40,000. By her 21st, in a few years' time, she'd have $71,150. And if we left it there just one more year, 80 grand. And then we go further. If we'd then reinvested the dividends, it would have been worth over 100 grand by the time she turned 21. Of course, 
there will be years where the share market drops 40% in a single year. And yeah, you've only got to look in the rearview mirror to last year to see that happen. But we've seen three of these times in the last 20 years or so. We had the dot-com bust, then we had the GFC, and then we had the massive financial impact of COVID. So we've seen that happen three times. But still, even if you're careful, it's all about having the right mindset about about money, both at home and the bit that we miss is usually at your club. So if you could have one of these things, a flux capacitor delivered, a delivered, a flux capacitor driven DeLorean time machine, and you could go back in time, would you do things differently? I bet you would. See, the thing is that all of the same principles that apply for me and Jess apply to our clubs. There was a football club whose name I won't mention who I was sitting with them, and this is going back, I think, about 15 years. And we were sitting around and we were doing some planning work. So in one of the strategic plans that we had, were putting together at the time, we were also focusing heavily on facilities and how to resource those facilities. So yes, we were talking about money. Yes, we were talking about grants, but we were more talking about their approach to money in general. Now, not to be nasty, they were just sitting around bitching and moaning about having no money to contribute when we were talking about this new change room development project. Now, I asked them, what would it be like if the people sitting right where you are, the committee members, say, 40 years ago, had been putting money aside into this thing called a sinking fund so that we were saving up to be able to replace the crappy change rooms that we've got and actually build some good ones? And they all said, they went, oh, Mark, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> well, hang on a minute. You are those people of the future. People will look back to you from 40 years in the future. And that's only 25 years from now, given that it was 15 or so years ago. So they will be looking back and you could be that generation that changes things completely. Or you could just say, oh, well, we'll do what everyone else does, which is nothing. But the thing is, I don't think doing nothing is a viable job. Like most things in life, the financial performance of clubs resolves itself nicely into this bell curve. Now, down the left-hand end, we'll call that the crappy end, you've got some clubs who just don't do it well. That's sometimes because they're in an area where they just can't do it well. They, they're highly competitive. But I'm not thinking about the external factors. I'm thinking not about what we can't do. What can we do? And that's where you've got the groups up the other side, the real star achievers, the ones who know about money, the ones who even have solid investment portfolios. And yes, clubs have, so once they work out what their risk profile is, they've put their $2.74 a day away for safety for the future, to be able to have that money when the committee members 40 years down the track are looking back to us to have it, to, to have ha, to having made great decisions. But it's this 80% in the middle, the big heavy bit of the bell. That's where most clubs reside. The thing is that you don't have to do a lot to move from the crappy side of the bell to the star side of the bell. You don't have to make massive changes. Just little bits of changes here and there can make massive differences to the level of your financial performance over time. And that's really where, where I want to be focusing this evening. Now, Steve and I have promised you all along that we wouldn't apologize for coming back to this very point. What does the term not-for-profit mean? Now, I think we've already done a poll or two on this, but I'm going to do so again. Those of you who have been here to our previous sessions, I hope you get it right. Those of you who are new, have a crack. So what do you think the term not-for-profit really means? I don't know, I'm not allowed to turn a profit, unable to share our profit with our members, only make a maximum of $150,000 in any year, or we're only allowed to have a maximum of a million dollars in the bank at any time. So what do you think the true definition of the term not for profit is? Remembering that we've got two sides of our P&L, the income, which is all of the money that comes in, and our expenditure side, which is all of, all of the money that we spend. When we total them up over a period, say a month if we're reporting monthly, or a year over time, then if we end up with a negative number, so if our expenses are greater than our profit, then we have a loss. If our, sorry, expenses greater than our income. If our income is greater than our expenditure, then we're left over with money. And that leftover money is called profit. But because of this, the, because there are some misconceptions around what the term not-for-profit really means, sometimes a profit in the not-for-profit sector 
is called a surplus instead. But call it what you like, it's still a profit. Okay, so let me show you the result here. The vast majority of you nailed this one. You got it absolutely right. We're unable to share our profit with our members. And for those of you who don't know, that's the only correct answer. So now I threw in some numbers here into this poll, the 150,000, for instance, that is there because that is the turnover threshold where a not-for-profit organisation in Australia must register for GST, the goods and services tax. The million dollars in the bank, it's purely a red herring. There is no limit to how much money we can have in the bank. There's no limit to how much income we can make, but there's also no limit to how much of that we can keep as profit. It's all it, it, it's all fine it's only that when we've got that profit at no point in your operation are you allowed to pay that profit out to your members as if you were paying dividends to shareholders that's the difference and it's the only difference between for-profit businesses and not for-profit businesses so yes we're still a business it's just that our structure as incorporated associations for the most part is not for profit. It's a not for profit business. And that's all that it means. So let's jump then to what the term incorporation means. So remember that we went through this in our first session where we set, we set the foundation of what incorporation meant. An incorporated association, which most of our football clubs are, is a legal entity that is separate from its members. So this club, once it becomes incorporated, is recognised legally in that it can now own things, it can buy things, it can sell things, it can enter into contracts like leases for your grounds, it can open bank accounts, it can have investment portfolios, and very importantly, it can sue and be sued in its own right. So it's not the members jointly and severally who are liable, save of course if you're being an idiot or stealing the money, it, it is the entity itself that can be held liable. What that means is if we, if we just jump back, this we are a business, it's just that we are a not-for-profit business, we've already got that structure. Our incorporated association status, and of course some football clubs, some of the larger clubs are companies limit, limited by guarantee. Either way, we already have the ability to run as the business that we are. But it also means that come time to employ people, we've already got the, the right sort of status that we as clubs can become employers. One point that I'd like to make at this, now that we're talking about money though, is the differences between the different levels of association when it comes to your financial reporting to the Office of Fair Trading, talking about incorporation. Prior to 2007, every organisation was treated the same. Whether you were a two-bit tiddlywink club, through to a massive incorporated association that that serves the whole services the whole state and has massive income. You were all treated exactly the same. As of 2007, however, there were three levels of organization. So a level three organization, incorporated association in Queensland, has a turnover and assets on the balance sheet of less than $20,000. But if either your turnover, so all of the money that comes in, and yes, that does include grants, if all of the money that comes in ticks over $20,000, or if the amount of assets that we've got showing on our balance sheet ticks over $20,000, then we become a level two incorporated association. Now, level three incorporated association does not need to have an audit of its books done anymore. Uh, all you need to, you still need to keep your financials, you still need to submit those financials to the Office of Fair Trading with your annual return, but they don't need to be audited financials. They can be verified financials. And that verification statement that says something along the lines of our accounting practices and our record keeping practices present true and fairly that this is our financial position can be made by the president or the treasurer. A level two organisation still doesn't need a full audit because they've got turnover or assets of, and or assets of between $20,000 and $100,000. They still don't need an audit, but their verification statement needs to be by an external and approved person like a CA or a CPA or an auditor. So sometimes level two associations, when they take it to a CA or a CPA or an auditor, they say, hey, I'm going to have to pretty much do an audit anyway. So they still have their books audited. But then we get into level one, organized that level one incorporated associations, and they are turnover or assets of over $100,000. So that could have been another red herring I used in the not-for-profit poll. But once you hit over $1,000 in assets or in turnover, 
then you must still have an audit done. So that means that you need to have an external auditor present an audit and then that audit is passed at your AGM, as we discussed during the AGM, that a lot of the stuff is about money. And then that gets submitted to the Office of Fair Trading. So that's the difference when we're talking about incorporated associations when it comes down to the financial management side. So let's run another poll. I'm interested in who is accountable for the financial management of an incorporated association. So I'll start this poll. Who's accountable for it? Is it Dunno? Is it our treasurer? Is it our president? Is it our management committee? Is it our VP? Or is it our secretary? Who do you think is accountable for the financial management of an incorporated association? So I'll just let that go. This is going well, very nice. Couple more seconds. So for those watching the recording who can't see this movement, we're watching the poll actually move as new votes are coming in. So that's all very, very exciting. All right. Three, two, one. Pins down, everyone. Righto. So three people, if we were in person, three people said treasurer and I would find who you were and I would give you a chocolate to say, well done, because it's the answer I was looking for. But it is wrong. Notice there's, there's one key word there. It's who is accountable for the financial management of the club. It's not who is responsible. So sure, if the question was who needs to do the financial management, who needs to keep the books, who needs to ideally prepare the budget, which we'll be spending time talking about tonight, of course, that's the treasurer. But when it comes to accountability, accountability is the management committee. So remember, who is the boss of a club? Some people think the president is the boss. The president is the boss of the meetings. The treasurer is the boss of managing the finances. But when it comes to being accountable, it is the whole management committee. The management committee is the boss of the club. So that's why it's important that it is the management committee that is accountable. So the way that you can think about the difference between accountability and responsibility, or the way that I like to think about it, because I haven't found a good dictionary definition, is you can delegate responsibility, which means I'm delegating you to be responsible for doing something, but I can't delegate accountability. So what that means is that all of us as management committee members, uh, we, can, we all need to be able to stand hand on heart and say, we are doing everything in our power to make sure that we are protecting the finances of this club because we are but short-term stewards of this organisation. So it is in our best interests, and because we're accountable, it's really important that we do, that we make sure that things are going well. So what that means, to tell you a nasty little story, and I'm sure you've heard these stories before about clubs that were eaten out from the inside. There's a terrible story of a gymnastics, a gy little gymnastics club that had, look, they were breaking lots and lots of rules. But because the treasurer, who was the person stealing all of the money, was a very big personality and also head coach and also president, which is not right. Remember when we talked about the positions on a management committee, the president and the treasurer must be different people. So they're breaking rules like that. But because she was such a powerful person, all of the other people on the management committee who were concerned that things didn't quite feel right or things smelt a bit funny, they didn't speak up because they were concerned that if they did, their kids wouldn't get picked in the rep teams. They were all accountable for the fact that she was stealing the money. Now, she did go to jail because she stole in the order of $36,000 from this club. But we can't just, okay, she did the wrong thing. And of course, we're going to blame her and she deserved to go to jail because that's just appalling. But they all didn't do the right thing. It's not because I don't like her. It's if, if you're on a management committee and you, you have a feeling, you get one of those little alarm bells going off in the back of your head or a red flag pops up in a meeting, Speak up, say something because you are accountable for it. It's not the purely that you can't just say, well, the treasurer didn't do their job. We can say, did we do everything that we could to make sure we had financial safeguards in place that these sorts of things couldn't happen? If they have happened to you before, what safeguards can you think about now? And we'll talk about those towards the end as well. So before we move on, I'd like to set a few of the basics straight. And now this is really important because only Wednesday or Thursday of last week, I read some information about this stuff that just wasn't right. 
So I just want to spend just a few minutes making sure that we get these, these definitions right. Now, one of the handouts that you'll see in the handout section over there on the left-hand side is financial terminology. So we've got some of this sort of stuff covered. And while we're talking about financial safeguards, boom, there's a little guide in there as well that you can have a look at that does have some information about making sure that you are safeguarding your, your club's money. So let's start with the ABN. The ABN is your Australian business number. Really, the best way to think about this is like a barcode. Now, I don't think that in 2021, there's any reason or any way that a football club in Australia could justify itself and saying, no, 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 we're not carrying on a business in Australia. That's what an ABN says. It says, we are carrying on a business in Australia. That's all that it says. There's no tax implications. You don't have to pay for it. You just register for it and that's it. That is your identifier. This is the organization that is doing business. You need to then quote that ABN on every tax invoice. And if you don't, then an organisation that or an individual that should be giving you money is it can withhold the top marginal rate, including the Medicare. They can withhold that amount of money and then remit that to the ATO on your behalf because they say, hey, they're not quoting me an ABN. I don't know if they're legit. So they can manage their own taxes. Now, as incorporated, associate, as incorporated football clubs in Queensland, we're income tax exempt. Have a look at the bottom point there. This is really important. That's one of the great benefits of being incorporated. And remember, we talked about that briefly in our first session. It's really, really great to be incorporated because we don't have to pay income tax. If we had to pay income tax, it would be at the company rate. Now, it's not just a given though. Income tax exemption is you are required to do an annual self-assessment for income tax exemption. So the best time to do this is just after your AGM or even at the AGM. If you look at, at our AGM agenda template, now minute keeping template, for instance, there's a little note in there that says, hey, make sure you're checking it. It's really easy to do. And I say this not tongue in cheek, the ATO's website is extremely helpful when it comes to not for profits. So have a look what it says there. And this, the checklist to use in doing your self-assessment is really simple but it just gives you peace of mind to be able to say, yep, we're ticking all the boxes and we are income tax exempt. Then you can minute that you've done that and then you've got it on, on the record. So that's a really important step. But having an income tax exemption won't stop somebody if you don't quote an ABN from being able to withhold the top marginal rate and send that to the tax office instead of giving it to you. So you'll all have one. If you don't have one, if, if any of the smaller organisations that are watching this down the track don't have one, look into it because really, it's e far easier to have one. GST then is not mandatory unless you go over that threshold that we talked about in our first poll. You must register for GST as soon as your annual, as soon as your turnover in any 12 month period. So yes, it's annual, but it's any 12 month period will exceed $150,000. Now this is twice the threshold for for-profit businesses. So we have that, but it's another one of the benefits of being a not-for-profit business is that we have a higher threshold before we must register for GST. So another great benefit. So it's $150,000. Then income and profit. So as we've talked about, income is all of the money that comes in, but profit is all of the money that's left over once we, once we deduct our expenses. So just because we made $4,000 at a Bunnings barbecue does not necessarily mean that it was a success. What matters is how much is left once we deduct what we have had to spend to run that barbecue to begin with. So then we get into some more of the technicalities. Let's talk about, let's now talk about the actual accounting methods here. So we've got what we call a profit and loss statement, which I think is kind of another misnomer. If we have a profit, then we have a profit. If we have a loss, so it shouldn't be called a profit or loss statement. I think it's a losing battle, so I won't push it too hard. So the profit and loss statement shows us our income and, or our turnovers, so all of the money that we, that we turn over that comes in and then all of the money that we've spent. And then that shows us down the bottom whether we have a profit or a loss. Now, ideally, given that not for profit doesn't mean no profit, ideally that should be a profit every time. Running at a profit is not bad. Making money is not bad. Being a rich club is not bad because it's the rich clubs that can give more. It's the rich clubs that can help more. So you've got to take accountability for the fact that we can do this. We can make money. We can make profit because when we do, because at no point can we distribute that out to our members as if it was as if we were paying dividends to shareholders, then at some point we are going to have to reinvest that money into doing what we do. 
which is football. So that's what I call the wonderful self-limiting factor of not-for-profitness. At some point, all of the money goes back into us doing a great job at what we do. The balance sheet then is our assets and our liabilities. Assets are our things and stuff, the things that we own. And yes, that includes money. It includes term deposits for those clubs at the pointy end of the bell curve that have an investment portfolio. It includes their investments. But then there's a difference between current and non-current assets and liabilities. And the accounting definition doesn't have anything to do with little shriveled up grapes. Currents, sorry, dad joke. What it means is our current assets are those assets that we've got that are cash or could be or we expect to be turned into cash within a year, within 12 months. Our non-current assets then are all of the things that we expect to still have after 12 months that we're not expecting to sell, that we're not expecting to turn into cash. So our current assets are money, all of our bank accounts. They are also our accounts receivable, but they can also include our stocks or the merchandise. We've got the food and drinks that are in the fridge because we don't expect to have those same cans of, of Coke Zero in the fridge this time next year. We expect them to have been sold when we have the money for those. And of course, they'd then be replaced. Non-current assets then are the things like our mowers, our line marking machine, our buildings. For some reason, sometimes they show up, even though they may be on council land. Sometimes the buildings, because clubs have invested in them, even through grant money, they still can then show up on our balance sheet. And then we get into liabilities. Liabilities are all of the things that we owe. And again, we've got current and non-current. So if we had a long-term loan, for instance, we don't expect to pay that off in 12 months and we have an agreement, so a written loan agreement, then that is a non-current liability. But if we've received invoices that we haven't yet paid, but obviously we expect to pay them within a year, then they are current liabilities. So when we get into financial management in more detail, and this is one of the things that we do when we work individually with clubs, is we look at where could the money be disappearing to? Where are the problem points? When we've got those people who don't pay, you know, the ones who, oh, sorry, mate, I've got to run out on the field now. I can't pay. I'll pay you next week. Oh. Then where does, where does that money show up? How do, what red flags are we looking for? What, remember we talked about solvency and now how management committees in Queensland can be held accountable for insolvent trading. And as Steve and I said, we think that we put it, should have had it like that forever. But this is also where you look to make sure that we are solvent, that we do have the ability to pay our debts as and when they fall due, because it's all right there. But where do you look for those red flags? So that's where we drill more deeply when we have the benefit of working more closely one-on-one -on -one with clubs. Just one quick note on grants, because I mentioned that grants are, grants are accounted usually on the profit and loss statement. But what that means is that we might get a whopping great grant come in, one of these shiny new ones from the Queensland government for 150 grand. We might get this whopping great grant come in and then our financial year ends. So because we're accounting for that on the P&L statement, we've got this money sitting there, but then our financial year again. So it looks like we've had this so, okay, grant income, but it looks like we're running at a massive profit. But then what's going to happen next year? Next year, we're going to have to spend that money, at least that amount of money on doing the project. So all of that money is going to have to go out. So then we're going to have a massive loss the following year. So sometimes you see these big sawtooth fluctuations from year to year in profit and loss when you literally just map that out in a, in a spreadsheet. And that can be why grant money comes in. But then when the grant money comes out, there's very rarely a line item on, in the expenditure of the P&L statement that says grant expenses. Sometimes some accountants are really smart and they do it like that, but often it's not. I think that it would be more logical for grants to be accounted on the balance sheet because if we get that money in, sure, it's an asset, but there's a liability of at least the same amount as that asset that we have to spend the money in delivering that project. We actually have to go and do the project. So that's a liability. So it kind of makes more sense that it would be accounted there. So then we get into the reporting. So you've got a monthly report and an annual report. The idea of your reporting is that it should be looking that way. So if you are a treasurer and you are doing the monthly financial reports, have you ever wondered why very often you present this beautifully detailed P&L summary from the general ledger, shows everything. Look, here's all of the money that we made broken down by business unit. Yes, business units. This is the money we made from memberships. This is the money we made from coaching. This is the money we made from the canteen. This is the money we made from the, the money we made from merchandise. This is the money we made from sponsorship. 
And people go, huh? it's because there's only one number. So if you are trying to use your financial management strategically, then you're far better off doing your reporting, be it monthly or annually, to report the actual amount that we made or spent versus the budgeted amount. What did we think we were going to make or spend? Because let's just pick one of those. Let's say canteen income. Let's say we expected canteen income to be $4,000 for the month, but it was $2,000 for the month. As soon as there's two numbers, budget, actuals, then there's a story. Why didn't we make enough? Were there environmental conditions that we didn't account for? Did we not do our job right? Did we set the budget wrong? All of these are the right questions that you can only ask when you've got that story. If they're the same, there's still a story. We thought we were going to do that. We did that. What did we do right? What can we do more of next time? If it exceeded it, there's still a story. What did we do so well? Are there environmental considerations we need to take into account? Was it an aberration? Will this happen again? Do we need to adjust our budget for next time? So if your financial reporting is just, here's how we did last month, it's really just over the shoulder rear view mirror gazing stuff. It's history. It's interesting. It's important. But we don't have that flux capacitor in our DeLorean, so we can't go back there and do anything different about it. All we can do is learn from it, both the good and the bad. What did we do that we should have done better? What didn't we do that we needed to do? And what did we do that maybe we shouldn't have? That's where we learn. So that's important. The other thing there to note about bank statements. Now, that's still there because the money in the bank can't lie. However, I'm not very good at Photoshop. Courtney is very good at Photoshop. I'm not very good at Photoshop, but I reckon I could still change a bank statement pretty easily to say, yeah, there's $100,000 in there when I'm the treasurer and I've secretly been stealing all of the money. So better than a bank statement is a live feed. Today, there is this much money. Look, there it is on my phone. There is this much money in the bank today because the person that I was telling you about from the gymnastics club, she was doctoring the books. And nobody asked the right questions. All right, can we please see the bank statement? Can we, please, can we please go to the bank? As soon as you get a sniff of something bad, that's the time to speak up. Now, the final point there is approval and ratification of expenditure. Approval means, obviously, we've got a bill and I'm now approving that we're going to pay that. Ratification means we got a bill, we paid it, and now we're approving it after the fact. So that's the difference between approval and ratification. Again, when we get into financial management at a more advanced level, we also start to talk about how you can do approval at the beginning of a year or beginning of a season for things that you know are going to come up over time. Now, when you get your budgeting right, that's when you can do this. For instance, pick me. If you pay for our services, then we would do a consultancy agreement up front. When you approve that consultancy agreement, even though there's invoice milestones that may be staged over six months, you don't need to then go and re-approve each time you receive an invoice because that invoice is coming in against an approved amount. Councils do the exact same thing when they approve a purchase order and every invoice that is against that purchase order must quote the purchase order number. So then they know if this is the purchase order, we've reached the milestone, it's time to be invoiced. Uh, when you've The same thing is true for your merchandise. If you know that you're going to order six lots of playing strips for the whole season, but you're not ordering them all at once. You can approve all six at once, but then just tick off the invoice, pay the invoices against that approved amount as the season rolls on. So as you start to take the delivery, same thing is true for the Coke Zero in the fridge. So it's that that's how you can then become more sophisticated in taking an approach that means that the treasurer's report, that thing that we get monthly that most people are going to go, hmm, okay, whatever actually becomes a really interesting and informative and strategic part of every meeting that you have. It's driving the economic engine of your business based on real facts, based on real information, plus our forecasts. As I said, sport is business. Sport in Australia is obviously big business. And the reason that we know that is because in a non-COVID year, sport injects 13 billion with a B dollars to our Australian economy. Now, sport is part of the very fabric of our existence, you know. We are mad about our sports. 
So it is big business. The bad side about that number that I just threw out, though, is that most of that money isn't going to the not-for-profit sector. Although the not-for-profit sector is by far and away the biggest provider of team sporting opportunities, we're not seeing the lion's share of that money. The lion's share of that money is going to the commercial sector. Now, I don't have a problem with, with businesses doing good business. I just want our not-for-profit businesses to do good businesses as well. So if, if that money is being funneled, uh, funneled away from the not-for-profit sector towards gyms, CrossFit, PT in a park, the expensive golf clubs, if that's where it's going, then what do we need to do to take a leaf out of their book to get a bigger piece of that pie? Or better yet, let's make the pie bigger. People can still go and play their golf and do their PT and do their, their CrossFit and, and, and everything else that they want to do. But let's just make sure that our level of service is high enough that people are prepared to pay us plenty more as well. The thing that we say here is don't run your club like a business. Run your club as the business that it is. It's just a not-for-profit business. So how can we make more money? What are some practical tips that we've got having worked with literally thousands of clubs right across the country? What have we seen the successful clubs do that you can take? What, what are they doing that you can do so that you can make lots of money as well? I just want you to think for a minute, maybe pop it in the chat. What do you think the number one thing that clubs should do to make more money is? Anyone want to have a go? I'll give you a second to put that in the chat. The number one thing. I don't necessarily know if I'd say it's the easiest thing to do. Maybe the most important. The number one thing to do. <laughs> Spend less. Mm -hmm. Stop. Oh, I like that one. Stop discounting fees. It's getting pretty close. You want to know what I reckon it is? Raffles. Ooh, okay. Oh, charge appropriate fees. Nice one, Damien. Yep, I like that one. I reckon collect them. If you charge fees, make sure you are getting them. So the reason that this is so important is because of a story. Now, this story is going to be possibly little, a little close to home, recognising that we've got people from all up and down Queensland here this evening. I want to take you back to 2017. Now, in 2017, we didn't know what the term social distancing meant. So that meant that we could all sit in a room and have these sessions face to face. So it meant that the people who said treasure actually got a real chocolate rather than having to duck to the pantry and grab your own. We started up north and basically worked our way down the coast and running these sessions. And they were great. They were really well attended, but we had kind of the same characters everywhere that we went. You'd, you'd have the, the kind of sit back in the chair and say, oh, I know all of this stuff anyway, at the start of the day, but by the end of that, again, I didn't know we could do that. And then you've got the people, you know, and some of them were the staff, some of them were the administrators or managers of the zones or the clubs in the zones. And they're sitting there with shoulders slumped saying, I really don't want to be here. But then by the end of the day, <laughs> saying, that was fantastic. If I'd known it was going to be like this, I would have brought the whole committee along. Now, the thing that was just a little bit scary was how things progressed when we got to this part of the day collect all of your fees. And then I'd innocuously ask the question, so has anyone got any war stories that they, they're prepared to share? Now, the first club up north somewhere, I won't say where, worried me because their story was, yeah, we had fees outstanding last year. And, you know, you can see all of the, the really closed in body language. Yeah, we had outstanding fees last year. How much? How much? Oh, about $8,000. And you just see jaws dropping around the room. Now, how much of that $8,000 did they think they were going to get back? Oh, no, we're going to get it because when they come back this year, we're going to make sure we collect all of their fees from last year before. We... <laughs> no. I bet Football Queensland won't release them. What does this mean? You didn't collect. They got their fees. You paid their capitation up the line. Don't worry about that. You didn't get your money, so you footed the bill. And what typically happens when they must pay and, and their, their hand is forced, they say, oh, and they go to another club. Then we moved down the coast and got to the next point. And I forget where it was, but the same story, same thing, and you know the number that came in? 16,000. I'm not lying. It was literally double. And my jaw dropped. Are you kidding me? 
Same story, not going to get the money. And other people around there are really getting it. And a few of those sheepish people are saying, oh, God, I didn't say anything. Because everyone has had, most clubs, sorry, have been through this in the past. There's a great comment in here from Sandra. We don't let any player take the field unless they have paid their fees or have set up a payment plan. Yep, great. But then make sure you enforce that payment plan, Sandra, as well. It's, there's no good having it if then they don't honour it. So there's a level of activity that you need to make sure happens so that they are actually honouring it. We finished in Brisbane. Very big zone. And I will tell you that this, this session was in the Queensland Sports and Athletics Centre, you know, one of the buildings, in, uh, one of the rooms in the Grand Centre overlooking the field. Lovely day. And it was just spectacular. And when we got to this point, so can you see the pattern? We had eight, we had 16. I, I just, like, I had to laugh out loud when they said $32,000 in a year of unpaid fees. Now, they might have got some of it back, by, but really, is that fun? And then people say, but I don't want to be a debt collector. I didn't take this job on to be a debt collector. No, they've signed a contract. They agreed to, you were going to provide a season of football with all of the touch points along the way, and I will pay the fee. That's perfectly, re it's perfectly reasonable. Let's just do it. So when they don't pay, just take a leaf out of Sandra's book. And we've had plenty of similar comments. Just make sure that you've got a no pay, no play policy, and then make sure you enforce it. So if you collect fees, get them. That's the first thing that you need to do to make, before you worry about any of these other things here, none of these matter if you've got eight, 16 or $32,000 in unpaid fees. So these are all of the other things that you can do. Of course, in usual times, canteen sales. What are we looking at in the canteen? So if, if we are smart and if we are future oriented and we are strategic about setting our prices, even in the canteen business unit, we can look for what do, where do, what do we make our money on? What are our real cash cows here? For one club, I forget what they called them, but they were little cups of cordial with a paddle pop stick or well, like a tongue depressor stuck in it. Literally, the plastic cup with cordial with a stick stuck in the freezer, and they sold them for 50 cents a pop. And they made over the course of a year squillions. And that was a real money spinner for them. So, how they then worked out that if that's where we're making our money because of the price point, because they're easy, because it's hot, it was in far north Queensland, let's get another freezer. So, it's exactly what they did. Icy cups. Thank you, Kate. Yes, icy cups. That's exactly what they were. So then we get to this, the, this discussion about raffles. So yeah, the, the bar is the same, merch the same, the drive, any drive, but I want to focus in on raffles for a sec. Now, the, you, when you run raffles, you do need to make sure that you are abiding by the rules. There are rules for what we call charitable and non-profit gaming, and there's an act for it here in Queensland. It replaced the old Art Unions Act. Now, you don't need a licence just to run a, a raffle if you, if you expect that you're going to make a couple of grand or less but there are some really simple rules that you do need to follow, like how much the prize value needs to be of expected revenue. Can we do $2 a ticket or three for five? Yes, you can, but you need to take that into consideration in doing your maths. It, it, can the intrinsic value of a price be higher than the actual purchase price of that? Because if I go and buy an Ollie Roos jersey, it's worth what, maybe $59, depending on where I get it. But if the whole team signs it, then what's it worth? Obviously a lot more. So then the expected income from the raffle can go up as well. But the important thing is you must keep good records. Look, we've got plenty of stories about all of these things where they can go amazingly well. But if you don't do what Damien said and you don't charge appropriate fees, then you're starting behind the eight ball every single year. So the only point that you're going to make money is when you sell membership. And that is the point of our next exercise. And this is the most important point of the evening. It's all about the budget. Now, Chris, who's in our team, says very often there's two types of budgets, those that are wrong and those that are lucky. And that's fine because, you know, if, you do, if your budget is right, then we may have got lucky. It might, it might have been completely outside of our control. That's perfectly okay but it doesn't mean you don't do it. And the sort of budget that I encourage you to do is not the same sort of budget that we do at council. So while we may say, yes, we're approving these items of expenditure over the course of our financial year, great, 
but it doesn't need to be as fixed as it would be for council because they know that their revenue is fixed. Hmm, we could learn from that, certainly. And so they allocate certain, certain items based on sometimes it does come down to politics. What has What are election commitments that we've made that we were then elected on? So we stood on a platform. We now need to honour that platform. So that's OK, especially when there's transparency behind it. But for us, it's about a budget that helps us to plan. That's what's most important. So the budgeting tool that I would think is the most valuable is something that says, firstly, how do we do that setting our fees right? What can we do to make sure that we know what information to look at to be able to set our fees appropriately? That's exactly what we've got. Now, this is on the surface a pretty good set of financials because there's the income. We've got a fair bit in there. So we'll take that first year there. We've got total income down the bottom line there, 81,895. Our expenditure for the same period was only 76,341. So we go, hey, we ran out of $5,500 profit this year. Ripper, that's great. We can afford to be in business next year. We'll be able to make it through the off season. Hmm. But let's now break this down a little bit further. So if I go back, you'll see that what we've done in this tool, and it's a very, very simple spreadsheet that you can have access to. I'll show you where to download it in a sec. All, what we've done is said the money that we make from this, the money that people have to give us, you know, no pay, no play, it's that money there, the money that they have to pay before they're allowed to play. That's the only real point that we know that we're going to make money that we know that we're going to be able to charge fees and collect those fees. So what are they for most clubs? For most clubs, on the whole, and on the aggregate, for all clubs, it's only one line item. It's that membership fee. It's the fee that we charge you to be part of our tribe. That's it. Some clubs charge game fees. Some have coaching clinics. that would say, yeah, that's definitely sport related. And some uh, have uh, gate takings as well. So if we have spectators, then that's sport related. So we'll call that part of the game. For a lot of clubs, though, and for a lot of you, it will just be that top one. It's only membership registrations where we know we're going to make money. But then have a look at all of the other areas where we make money canteen, bar, clothing, merchandise, uniforms, facility hire, sponsorship, fundraising initiatives. Notice that I haven't got grants there because grants are money in, money out. So we can treat them separately. And they're always project related, foreshadowing what we'll be talking about in three weeks' time. So when you divide it like that, you can see that there's not a lot of opportunity that we've got to definitely make money. Because look at all of those things in the white. Canteen is discretionary spend. People don't have to eat at the canteen. They could go home hungry and eat at home. They could bring a cut lunch if they're going to be there the whole day. They could seriously drive down to Macca's. Bar. People don't have to drink at the bar. Responsible Service of Alcohol says that some people shouldn't, especially those that are driving. So we, we can't just look at that as a cash cow. Our clothing, our merchandise, uniforms, maybe if it's sport, maybe sport related. But if it's a, a training strip then and, and it's discretionary, do people have to buy it? Maybe not. Facility hire, people don't have to. So you can see that and COVID taught us wonderful lessons about sponsorship. Small businesses, unfortunately, but rightly, had to withdraw their sponsorship very quickly entering into COVID. So that was something that dried up completely outside of our control. It just dried up literally overnight. Fundraising people don't necessarily, they don't have to buy our lamingtons, our pies, our prawns, our raffle tickets, come to our events. Okay, then let's look at the green items, the sport-related items on the expenditure side, however. So where we had a very short list of income, it's a very long list of sport-related expenditure. Now, sport-related expenditure includes all of those things where we need to spend money to be able to run our club, to be able to run football, and to be able to be incorporated, because we've got to be an incorporated association to be affiliated with Football Queensland, to be able to run football. So all of those things, we can't not pay. Those are, and coming into COVID, we learnt that, some clubs learnt that the hard way. All of the things that we have had to keep spending money on, even though our operations dried up. That was a real wake up call for a lot of us. But notice that the ancillary expenditure is the same list. It's just the cost of goods sold for all of the things. We bought the food to sell, we bought the drink to sell, we bought the clothes to sell. We bought the sign to put on the fence to make the sponsorship income. So while the bottom line says that we made money, there's a good chance that when you add up all of the green things, all the things we must spend, 
they exceed the amount of money that we're making when we're charging our membership fees. And that is the, that is the, the main key of this spreadsheet. Tab number four then says, well, let's do the maths. What's our total sport related income? Our total sport related income is just those four line items on the first tab that add up here to just a tick under $40,000. Our total sport related expenditure, though that massive big long list of green items of expenditure, the things we've got to spend, add up to almost 54 grand. So now, like I'm about as good at maths as I am at Photoshop, but I can see that that's about 14 grand the wrong way. So if we think that we're going to have about 350 members, that's fine, let's plug that number in. And recognizing that our mini ruse will pay less money than our first team, that's fine. But on average, the average cost to the club per member at line D there is $153, of which we're only making $113, which leaves us 40 bucks per player in the red on membership fees. So what that means is that we're selling sausages, shirts, socks, hats, key rings, signs on fences to subsidise people to play football. The question I've got is, is that a sustainable business model and I offer that it's not because the people who are doing all of that making all of that ancillary money there are they going to be around forever and are the people who take over from them going to have the same level of commitment to be able to do the same spend the same amount of time and do the same amount of volunteer work to cover all of the work that they were doing so if we're relying on those people staying and what happens if they move, get a, a better offer of a mum and dad, get a better offer somewhere and they move. They don't want to play, they, their kids don't want to play football anymore. These are all things that are largely outside of our control. So what is important is that we set up a business model based on sustainability. And that's exactly what this tool encourages you to do. Some clubs look at that, some committees, and they say, 40 bucks, you know what? That feels exactly right for our community and our tribe. And we're happy with that. And we believe in our heart of hearts, that we've got the volunteers that will help support that. Great. It's fantastic. Then you make the decision, but you're doing so with eyes wide open. I have all of the information and I'm making an informed decision based on this real data that I'm getting from the sheet. If, however, a, the worst, I won't tell you the worst case scenario, I think it was 700 bucks. It was hockey though. And they realised that they were in serious trouble. They made changes over time. And if you realise then that we want to charge that 40 bucks extra per player, then you can say, okay, how are you going to do that? Because it's right to do that from a business perspective, but how are you going to communicate that to your members? So the customers want to then see a breakdown. Now, while I don't think that it's okay for me to walk into a, a, a any fast food place and order a hamburger and then say, right, so of the... $12 I'm paying for that hamburger. How much am I paying for the lettuce? And how much am I paying for the mayo? And how much am I paying for the ketchup? No, no, no. But to know where our cost centres are, I think is reasonable to share that. So you'll see that this graph, again, this is tab number three, and it will automatically create this graph based on the figures that you put in to the expenditure. So all of these green items in the expenditure tab, they are all what shows up when we get to this, bar uh, to this pie chart here. So in communicating this to your members, you can say this club might take, all right, we're going to take a three or four year staged approach to, to increasing our fees to make sure that we're making enough to actually cover our costs. So we want to get that $40 to zero. We want to just break even. Then they can say, this is telegraph your punches. Let everybody know this is what you're doing. So next year, your fees are going to go up by $20. The year after that, by 10. The year after that, by another 10. So over to, and then they're going to go up by at least CPI every year. So you're letting them know. If anyone then kicks up a stink, here's the graph. You can say, well, we've done our maths and we can't see anything in here that we can really do with that, but I'm very happy to sit with you and, and let's explore it together. What, what do you think? Oh, that presentation day, that's a big thats a big chunk of pie, isn't it? Oh, no, 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 you got to leave that. Kids love the presentation. Oh, and by the way, they love what you're doing with the, the rides, you know, and the, the food that you got and the icy cups. <laughs> so what's just happened is you've turned a conversation about why the fees need to be as they are into getting a pat on the back for the great work you're doing. So this is really the public relations piece in here and being able to say... This is how we've done, this is how we've worked it out. We can't see anything. We can't take out our electricity. They'll turn the lights off. We can't not pay for our insurance. We can't not pay for our coaching. 
Now, just secretly though, the only piece of the pie that I've worked in exactly how big I want it is the one called facility improvements. So notice that we've got repairs and maintenance and that's a real cost, so we know that. But the facility improvements line item here is one that I thought, well, what feels about right? About 10% feels right. So what that is, don't call it this, that's the sinking fund. So that's where we can make a dedicated contribution every year at a, at a percentage that we set to say, we need to grow. We need to make sure that we've, we, we are able to replace our lights when they blow, that we, can re, that we can paint the clubhouse when it needs it, that when the, the door locks stop working in the, in the toilets, we can go and fix it because we've got the money to do that. That's that wedge. So if we call it sinking fund, then people say, money for the future, I'm not going to be here, I don't want to pay that. And it's, look, it's a done thing, but we're humans and so we're, not, we're certainly not creatures of logic. But to put that in like that, yeah, of course I want facilities improved. So that's the only point, again, with full transparency from me to you so that you can be transparent from you to your members. So that's what's most important. So really running through this in, in only a flyby for the last hour or so, I hope that you understand that, most importantly, sport is business. It's big business and it should be fun. And for it to be fun, you don't want to have money problems. You know, you don't, when things are tight at home, when you have to take a pay cut, you know, COVID again taught us some wonderful lessons. You don't want that anxiety and you certainly don't want it from a club level because we're volunteers. So you can make some really simple changes that make your lives very, very, very much better. The last one that I want to talk to is to make sure that you are using technology to the best of your ability. Now, for any of you who are still just using an Excel spreadsheet to keep your books, please consider moving to a more sophisticated model. I know that lots and lots of clubs have been using MyOB for a long time. Zero is a more recent player and it was built for the cloud from the ground up. So it is very popular in the sports sector. It is also the, uh, one that offers a great discount for not-for-profits. It's 25%. So while, while it is about 50 bucks a month to get access to a lot of the services of, of Zero accounting package, it's 25% off for us. So if you, if you are using Zero and you're not getting your 25% off, get straight in touch with them and they will be very happy to help. QuickBooks is a very new player in the market and QuickBooks, Intuit QuickBooks is, is really, really good as well. It's probably a bit cheaper. And the, I've heard now, I'm no accountant, I'm no bookkeeper, but I've heard that they're scared of zero being so good. So they want in on zero's market as well. The others there are Asasu and FreshBooks, for instance, and Zoho Books. Asasu and FreshBooks particularly are, are relatively cheaper options for clubs with simpler requirements. But what's important is that you don't shy away from spending a little bit of money on software to get a massive benefit because the time saved will always be spent. But the time that your treasurer saves in not having to do manual accounting, not having to do a manual reconciliation, because we can do all of that on the screen with a lot of it already looking for the transactions that marry up, they will still spend their time, but that's how they're going to buy their time to be doing that budgeting. To be able to be able to be able to say, you know what? Let's have a good look at this. Let's consider our pricing. Let's take those steps. Let's work out how we're going to communicate. And the final word is on asset track. There, asset track is you may notice for those of you who we've already discussed uh, d discussed meeting track with, and who joined us for our demo of meeting track last time. One thing that you may not know is that every incorporated association in Queensland, as part of the incorporated association regulation, must have an asset register. The depreciation schedule at the back of your financial statements every year is not your asset register because how many of the assets on there you don't, do you maybe not even own anymore? Or have they been sold, they've been lost, they've been destroyed, they've been written off? How many new assets have you purchased that nobody ever thought to actually include in that depreciation schedule? And are we using that depreciation schedule to save tax? No we should be using that depreciation schedule to inform how much that wedge of the pie is, our facility improvement wedge. If we're depreciating those assets, sure, we're never going to be able to claim a tax deduction for them, but we are going to need to replace them. So it's important that we've got the money to be able to do so at the right time. In developing asset track then, we didn't want it just to be an asset register. Sure, you've got to go and put all your assets in, but it's really simple. 
and the user interface is very friendly and familiar. So if you've used an internet before, you'll be able to drive asset track. But the important thing is that most of your assets, if not all, right down to my trusty little phone, will have a certain element of maintenance that's required on them. So if it's my phone, for instance, and it's a club phone, then the club should know that this phone is still in working order. So every six months or so, I should still say, hey, there's my phone, still works, screen still works, still got the case, everything's fine. Through to our buildings that have maintenance for the for the plumbing and gas, maintenance for the electrical work. If you have asbestos, asbestos, asbestos inspections, test and tag. So you can use Asset Track then to program all of that maintenance. It comes up with automatically comes up with what those maintenance activities may need to be based on the type of asset and its subcategory. So we will organise a demo of Asset Track because we've had a bit of interest in Asset Track already from football clubs. So we will organise a demo in the same way that we have for Meeting Track. But of course, if you want to check that out in the meantime, please feel free to do so at Asset Track, A S S E T T R A C dot com dot A U. So the takeaways for this evening. I'm not even going to call this number one. It's just if you're not investing already, if you don't have that sinking fund, if you don't have a mindset that says we need to have money for the future, we need to be setting our club up for long term sustainability, do it and just do it now. Start now. work out where you've got that extra money that you are able to invest, even if it's only in a no bank accounts are making any interest at the moment, but even if it's only having that cash there as saved up, but then think about what your investment profile would be, what your risk profile would be take advice and then work out the best place to be keeping your money so that remembering that you are the stewards of it. It's not okay to not be doing the best and safest thing that you can based on the club's profile. So number one then, not for profit does not mean no profit. Make profit, make as much as you reasonably can because it will always be reinvested in what you're doing, which will make you a better club and you will be able to give more value, more service, more football opportunities to your members. Collect your fees. If you're charging fees, make sure you're collecting them and then review your pricing. Then use that review to make sure that you or use the budget to make sure you're doing that review right and use that review to inform your budget. And finally, make sure that you are using technology that is there to help. Let it help you. As I promised, the resources that are available, there's the Sports Club Budget Planner. Now, that's the fee planning tool that is a very simple Excel workbook. And that is available at the link here, which I'll come back to, cprgroup.com.au slash financial dash management. But the other ones that are already available in the handout for you to download handouts straight away, our little sponsorship guide. So that's very handy to make sure you're thinking about sponsorship the right way, our financial safeguards fact sheet and the financial terminology fact sheet, as I promised. So as I jump down to this one to leave that web address on the list for you, I'll throw back to Courtney and see if there are any questions that we can answer in the minus two minutes left that we've got. Uh, thanks, Michael. I'm just also posting that link into the chat so people can copy and paste Excellent. there too. Thank you. Um, you've already answered one question while you're talking which was great about okay. the, um, <laughs> should grants be recorded on the PL or as liabilities. So you've covered that one off. Awesome. Uh, great question, yeah. by the way. Who was that? That's a, that, I, I, a chocolate for whoever asked that one. Like, well done, Larry. Love it. <laughs> um, we've got another one about where something should be recorded. So um, Michelle says she loves the sinking fund. Um, but should it be, uh, should the sinking fund be recorded as an expense and reserve system in the financial report? Oh, that might be a question best asked of your accountant. I know that once you've made the investment of the sinking fund, so once you've started an account, then that those cash reserves will definitely show up on the balance sheet. But whether you would, I, I don't necessarily think that you would. I'm not an accountant, I'm not a bookkeeper, but I don't think you would expense it because you're not actually spending that money. You're, it's it's still members' equity, so it will still show up as the overall financial benefit of the club. Excellent. That's the only question that's, that's come through. Fantastic. Good stuff. Well, thank you everyone very much again for joining us. Thanks also for having some fun in the chat as well. I always like getting into the chat at the end of the session and reading through it. So thank you for keeping that going. And I encourage you to certainly do so again next time. And as a reminder, if you haven't already registered for our next session on the 16th of August, opportunities for funding and applying for grants. As a little teaser for that one, 
the best way to get grants is to forget about grants. Be a really good business with a really good project and then the grant money finds you. That's kind of the irony of grants. The clubs who look like they don't need them are the ones who benefit from them the most. So if you haven't already registered for that one, I definitely encourage you to do so. And of course, bring a friend and send, spread the word as well. And, and I mean that very friendly, friendly as well. So if you've got people that you know in other clubs, please do share the links to the webinars with them because you'll also find the recordings of each of the past sessions at the same link or access to those via the same link, CP, same link cprgroup.com.au slash fqwebinars2021. If you haven't yet signed up for our newsletter, you can certainly do that at the bottom, bottom of the homepage of our website, cprgroup.com.au. Follow us on social media, stay in touch with Football Queensland as well. All of the resources that we're providing as part of the webinar series are also going to be available or are being made available on the club support hub so make sure that you stay in touch with stay in contact with that as well because it's a great place to get all of your information and we also love a chat so if you want to contact us we have a phone number and you can still ring us 1800 100 204 thank you very much again everyone i look forward to your company again next time and in the meantime enjoy the olympics and play well see ya <laughs>